Praise God. And Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would bless your word to our hearts tonight and give clarity and understanding to your ways in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this evening's message has been sitting on my desk for the last two years. Actually, I was looking at the date, and it's April 2020, so, but tonight was a perfect time to to deliver it. Interestingly, I had just finished a message yesterday, and I had such similar thoughts and verses. You're probably going to get a little repeat of this on Sunday, but... Also, we have some handouts uh, after the after we finish here. But anyway, this evening I'd like to give a little briefing on biblical dispensations. So, what is a dispensation? It's a, a dispensation in this case, of course, is a time period. So, understanding biblical time periods is very necessary in order to understand the times in which we live. So, very important little subject here. We live in a very unique, at a very unique time on the divine calendar. The scripture gives 7,000 years to the Adam creation. And so we're going to break this 7,000 years into segments or dispensations. And our main objective here is to understand where we are on the divine calendar. Amen? We did start this, right? Good. Um, but anyway, that's very important. Remember the tribe of Issachar? They had an understanding of the times in which they lived, and the people were at their command because the people recognized that they had knowledge of the period of time that they lived in. And so just looking at First Chronicles for a minute, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it says, uh, And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were two hundred, and all their brethren were at their commandment. This tribe had an understanding of the times, and so they had the attention of their brethren. But you see, when we have an understanding of where we're at, people will come to us and they'll listen to what you have to say. They know you have something that they don't have. Now, the 7,000 years given to man parallel somewhat to the seven days of creation. Actually, man was to labor six days and to rest on the seventh day. And then man was to work the fields for six years and then rest the field on the seventh year. They couldn't plant, harvest, or anything on the seventh year. And so the land was to to rest. And there's a lot of types, actually, in Scripture. There's 6,000 years given to man. That is the worldly government, worldly human invention. And then there's coming a thousand-year period of time when There's going to be divine government upon earth, and there's going to be peace, and there's going to be rest. The whole earth is going to be at rest, and it's going to be singing, because divine judgment, and there's a divine government upon earth. Now, Peter gives us a little key. You know, there are key verses, very important. But looking at 2 Peter 3.8, it's a key verse to understanding a lot of verses. And Second Peter 3.8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, there are certain scriptures that you could never understand unless you use this key verse here. And we'll consider this a little bit as we continue on here. But right now, let's just consider briefly these time periods, and then we'll look at them a little closer. But we want to bring it into present tense reality and see where we are 
on the divine calendar. So let me first mention these six time periods. Actually, some see seven, some have more than that, but um, you could probably put that up on the overhead if you want to. And as I said, we'll come back and give a brief explanation for each one, but the first one here, the first time period we have is the Antediluvian Age, and that uh, takes in a period from Adam to the to the flood. So we're looking at 1,600 years here from Adam to the flood. And actually, um, some people see Adam, the time of Adam as a certain period is called... Um, uh, what do they want to call that? The age of innocence. Uh, I don't know how long Adam was innocent, but you know, really, God is not after innocence; He's after holiness, and so innocence has to be tested. And um, so, God is going to test us, and when we come through the test, and we pass the test then we are holy, and that's what he's after. Not innocence. A baby is innocent, but he wants us to become holy. And then, number two, we see the origination and the placement of nations, which takes in what we could look at 400 years from the point of the flood unto Abraham, which is the third age, Age of Patriarchs, which lasted for about 500 years. Then number four, we have the Old Testament age, 1,500 years from Moses to the cross. And then we have the New Testament age, which is takes in 2,000 years. And then we have, finally, the Millennial age, 1,000 years for a total of 7,000 years. Now, actually... Uh, I, I kind of rounded this off. I did because you could, there could be a 50 year variance. So I just rounded it off to make it a little bit easier. Okay, but there's 7,000 years basically in the Adam creation and 6,000 years given to man and then 1,000 year reign of Christ. Okay, so let's look at number one here the Antiluvian age, the age. Before the flood, Adam to Noah, 1,600 years. And then we have the dissemination of, of nations. And from Noah to Abraham uh, is 400 years. And during this period, the nations, of course, came to Babel, Babylon. And uh, they were defined genetically. All of their speech was changed, their language was changed, their genes were changed, and then they were placed. During the days of Peleg, the nations were divided into various parts of the earth during that period of time. And so you have Genesis 11 for the Tower of Babel, and then the nations being divided during the days of Peleg in Genesis 10:25. But let's look at a verse in Acts, Acts 17.26. Acts 17.26, it says that he hath made of one blood all nations of man for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So God placed these nations uh, in different parts of the earth. It was during the days of Peleg, the earth was divided, and I think even the earth was um, was kind of, it was all one mass at one time. I think that's when the earth was actually divided and pulled apart. But anyway, another subject. So God placed the nations, and then during the age of the patriarchs from Abraham to Moses, covers about 500 years, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat the 12 sons. And they went to Egypt for about 400 years, 
but that whole period covers about 500 years. And then we have the Old Testament from Moses to Christ. And of course, uh, the Old Testament began Mount Sinai, giving of the law. And the age of the law, the Old Covenant was in force until the cross. So about 1,500 years, Old Covenant. And then we come to Christ. And of course, he had to die to put the New Testament into force. And let me just read here from Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 16 and 17. I I hate to rush, but we're a little bit behind here, and I want to cover this uh, as quick as possible. But uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16 and 17, and it says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. In other words, a will is not in force until the person dies, right? Well, going on to verse 17, for a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So Christ had to die to put the testament into force. And that was around 30 AD. So that began the new covenant. And uh, the New Testament, from the ascension of Christ to the second coming of Christ, covers about 2,000 years. Now, Christ returns at the end of the church age, second coming. Uh, And so when he comes, that will complete 6,000 years. The second coming completes 6,000 years, and then there's going to be a 1,000-year Sabbath, 1,000-year rest. Okay, then we have the millennial, that is the millennial age, 1,000 years, when Christ is reigning with his government upon earth. And at the end of that comes the great white throne judgment. So millennium means 1,000, and... That 1,000-year reign of Christ, I want to be here. I don't know about you. I want to be here. I want to be a part of that that government. But it will bring peace on earth. The earth is going to be renewed. You know, there's a lot of people, activists today, that are concerned about, you know, the earth. But, um, you know, during the millennium, the earth is going to be renewed. In fact, there's going to be a river that flows from the temple touches that flows out and everything it touches lives it's going to go down into the mediterranean the mediterranean the dead sea everything comes back to life again so uh, i don't think you have to worry too much about um, saving the earth uh, it's it's already written all right and then in isaiah chapter 14 and verse 7 it says This is the millennium. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. So it's going to go back to the way it was in the beginning. The lion and lamb lie down together. You know, everything changed when Adam fell. And so it's going to go back to the way that was in the garden. And so the whole earth is at peace and is singing. Even nature is changed during the millennium. It's good news, isn't it? And so animals won't be preying on each other. But we're considering these time periods that are given in Scripture. I mean, all Scripture is profitable, but it bolsters our faith and it gives us an answer for those who are around us. We want to be like the sons of Issachar, children of Issachar. Now, I want to move on to the Moses tabernacle here. And uh, Moses tabernacle was a pattern of spiritual or heavenly truths. And it says that in Hebrews 8, 5. But one of the truths that we find in Moses tabernacle concerns dispensations. There's three dispensations revealed in Moses tabernacle. 
tabernacle. I think most of you are quite acquainted with this here, but um, just for a refresher, of course, anyway, um, we find in the outer court that the measure of the outer court is 1,500 square cubits. The fence is 300 uh, cubits around, and it's five cubits high, which comes to 1,500. The age of the law is 1,500 years, about 1,500 years from Mount Sinai to the cross. All right? Then we move into the next section of the tabernacle, and the dimension there is 2,000. It's 10 by 10 by 20. It's 2,000 cubic cubits. 2,000 is the church age. So there's 2,000 years to the church age. Then there's another veil, another section, which is the Holy of Holies, which is 10 by 10 by 10, which is 1,000 cubic cubits. That's the millennial age. So you see all three uh, dispensations here in Moses' tabernacle, Old Testament, New Testament, millennium. Okay, everybody's clear on that, right? Um, so the church age is 2,000 years, and the church age began at the cross, and there's many other symbols that bear this out. For example, Israel was following the ark in the wilderness. They had to have a gap between themselves and the ark. And what was the gap? How far was it? What do you know? 2,000. 2,000 cubits between Israel and the ark. They couldn't approach. It was a 2,000 gap. There's a 2,000 gap in the uh, tabernacle, of course, because Israel essentially is cut off for the church age as a nation for 2,000 years. They don't enter in. They don't see Christ until the end of the church age. So they, if you want a reference on that, you could put Joshua 3, 4. They were going to be cut off for the whole age of the church. That is, as a nation, of course, there are Jews who believe, but so the ark is behind the veil. The ark speaks of Christ. And for the nation of Israel, the veil is still there. They don't see Christ. But at the second coming, the veil is lifted and they see Christ. All right. And then also notice in Hosea, book of Hosea, chapter 6 and verse 1. 6 and verse 1, it says, um, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. Now you couldn't really understand this unless you understood unless you had the key verse from Peter. Because after two days, that's 2,000 years, they're going to live again. Israel has been cut off essentially for the 2,000 years. Two days. On the third day, they live again. Amen? Is that clear? And actually, I allow questions in my class. That's what I like about Bible school. You can allow questions. But see, these verses don't make sense unless you understand Peter's key verse there in Second Peter two uh, three eight. A day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. So Israel is cut off for two days, three two thousand years, and on the third day they live again. That's the beginning of the millennium. Here's another one. In John two one we see a, a marriage, a wedding in Cana of Galilee on the third day. Now, you know, wherever you see numbers mentioned, there's a truth here. This is not just put in there. There's a marriage on the third day. And so it's on the third day, 2,000 years after the 
church age, there's going to be a celebration in Israel. They're coming back into the fold here again. All right. Now here's another good one in Mark 9 and verses 2 and 3. And this is after six days. Now remember, six days is 6,000 years. 6,000 years given to man, and then there's going to be a thousand year rest. But at the end of six days, the Lord comes. Second coming, right? Okay, so in Mark 9, 2, it says, After six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. After six days. Now, why would it say after six days? Uh, on the sixth day, Jesus is coming, and he's going to be transfigured. He's coming resplendent in glory. And these disciples got a little preview of that, didn't they, after six days? They got a little preview of the coming of Christ, that Mount of Transfiguration. Pastor, can I ask a question? Sure. I would say that. I would say so. Because we're picking right up, you know, at the, where they're at. 1500, yeah. I would say that. Okay. So, uh, many parabolic teachings that revealed 2000 years to the church age. Here's a good Samaritan. Um, he, uh, comes across the beat up man on the road takes care of him, takes him to an inn, and says, take care of him, and he gives him two pence. That's two days' wage. Um, And when I come again, I will repay. He gave him enough to take care of him for two days. A penny was a day's wage. Gave him two pence. When I come again, he comes after two days. Now, here's another good one. Um, It's concerning the deliverance. Um, This man possessed with all of these devils. You find the account, Matthew 8, Luke 8, Mark 5. And uh, taking all of these three synoptics into account. um, And just bear in mind, Jesus' ministry began around the 4,000th year. Remember, 4,000, 2,000 to the church age. So his ministry began about the year 4,000, 4,000 years from Adam to Christ. And he confronts this man who is demon-possessed, totally controlled, and he is just filled with demons. And he, he challenges this prince demon who's in this man, and he says, what's your name? And what is the response? Legion. Now, a Roman legion is 6,000. So he identifies himself as 6,000. And these demons know when they're going to be destroyed. They're going to be destroyed at the 6,000th year when Christ comes. Is that correct? When Christ comes, the earth is going to be cleansed. You find that in Zechariah, that every unclean spirit has to leave the earth. They know when they're going to be destroyed. And so they're saying to him, are you come to destroy us before the time? Now they know when their time is. So at the 6,000th year, they're at the 4,000th year. So you remember what they said. They said, "Uh, don't destroy us, send us into this swine. They have to, they want to, you know, inhabit something. And so... The Lord said, okay, go. And they went into the swine. How many swine was there? 2,000. See, these numbers are are not just there because, you know, 2,000 years till they're going to be destroyed, right? However, they were destroyed right then because they went down into the deep. The swine ran over the cliff and went into the deep, and so they were taken right at that point. But they know their time. 
Have I lost you on that? No, if I have, I can repeat. So, uh, have I lost you on that? Okay. But that's the major point. These these uh, demons know they're going to be destroyed at the 6,000th year, and they're begging Jesus, send us into the swine. And there were 2,000 because it would have been 2,000 years that they would have been destroyed, but I think they got uh, taken a little bit early because they went down into the deep, and I would say I would take that as meaning they went down into hell. Anyway, to bring this, start wrapping it up, we have to see our time in history here, and we cannot know our time if we don't understand these dispensations. So the church age began around 30 AD when Christ died and put the New Testament into force. So there's 2,000 to the church age, about 2,000. So that would bring us to when? 2030, right? (laughs) 2030. Now I'm not saying Christ is coming in 2030, but it's about, all right? It's about that time. So we have maybe about a decade, something like that. Uh, So we're living in a very climactic time in history, and we're living at a time when we're going to see a lot of fulfillment of Scripture. Now, Jesus spoke this in the last week of his life on the Mount of Olives. He Oh, actually, we'll see a little of that Sunday, but um, he was asked three specific questions. But um, when you take a look at the Olivet Discourse, you have to take in all three Gospels. Matthew 24 actually goes into 25, and then Luke 21, Mark 13, and put them all together to get the complete picture of of the last days. Um But another sign that Jesus gave to this generation of his coming was when you see the fig tree begin to blossom again. Now, the fig tree is symbolic of what? Israel. It's like the cedar tree is a symbol of Lebanon. It's a symbol of Israel. And if you recall, actually, Jesus cursed the fig tree in Mark 11, but he said, when you see the fig tree coming back to life, blossoming again, you know that the time is at hand. Well, actually, Israel became a nation, to be exact, May 14th, 1948. I was born before that. But Jesus said, the generation is, this generation that sees Israel coming back to life would not completely pass away until all of these things would be fulfilled. So we're living in a generation when Israel has been reborn, they became a nation after 2,500 years. And this generation will not pass away until all of these things that are spoken of in Matthew 24 and, and the other Gospels as well. All right, the symbol of the fig tree. But there are still um, a number of things that have to take place within this next decade. And some of these things are taking place right now, like even the pandemic is just the beginning of things to come. Um, worldly man can discern the weather. And actually, I'm amazed at how accurate the weatherman can be sometimes. And uh, uh, with all of the modern technology, they can call it pretty close. Um, He can discern the weather, but he cannot discern the signs of the times. Um, And that is why we have to understand our time and what God's people are to do. 
We're in the beginning stages of that last period of time. And as the old song goes, signs of the times are everywhere. Amen? Even this pandemic is a little precursor of things to come. But the greatest trial and the greatest revival are on the slate for the near future. Great darkness and great light. Um, And just to recall a very familiar verse here from Isaiah 60. And this light is coming during a very dark time. Isaiah 60 verse 1. Arise and shine for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Uh, I really believe that that revival is coming and it's going to kind of coincide a lot of it with some of the trial that comes as well. In fact, I remember a verse in Isaiah chapter 21 back a few years ago. I was talking to Charlie Phillips and I was giving him them, giving him an interpretation to a certain verse there. Where the watchman is saying, watchman, watchman, what of the night? And and the response is, well, the morning cometh and also the night. That doesn't make sense, does it? But really what he's saying is that the morning is coming and also the night. They're coming together. That for some it's going to be morning, for some it's going to be night. For some the day is dawning, for some... It's becoming very dark. And so I really believe that the greatest revival is coming during a time of great darkness. So I see things, you know, coinciding. Uh, Revival and tribulation kind of coming together. Um, But anyway, uh, you see this in Matthew 24, famine, cataclysms. And all of these things that are precursors. But uh, one thing that we want to take note of that must come before the end is great revival. And so this comes before the abomination of desolation. And in Matthew 24, 14, it says... And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. There has to be great revival. We're living in that time. We have to be getting close, folks. Really. I mean, and it's going to be with tremendous force, too. It's not going to be any small revival. It's not going to be something that's just taking place in some church on a corner, but... But... uh, It has to come with tremendous magnitude because of the shortness of time. And there are other references, too, we could give you from Revelation, where there's a true gospel that's being preached, not what we're seeing coming across the airwaves today. And also, there's coming a warning concerning taking the mark, which has to, there has to be a worldwide warning not to do this. And then in Matthew 24, we see the abomination, an act that takes place in a temple. There is no temple yet. There has to be a temple, doesn't there? Matthew 24, 21, there's, after this act takes place in the temple, man puts his image in the temple. 24, 21, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. What's the next part of that verse? But for the elect's sake. The elect are here. Amen? Now some people say, oh, the elect, that's the Jews. No, the elect is the redeemed. But for the elect's sake. In fact, the deception is going to be so bad that if it were possible, even the elect could be deceived. Now, that's not Israel. They're already deceived. The elect is the church. Okay? 
The elect are God's people. That's us, folks. You know, we often hear it preached, you know, the church is going up seven years before the end. I don't know where in the world they ever come up with that. I mean, I know where it came from, but you don't see it in Scripture, that's all. We do see God preserving his people in Revelation 12, at least a segment of them, those in the holy place. And then, too, we have to see something happen in Israel. We have to see a temple come about. Um, But then, after this tribulation begins, after this tribulation comes the catching up. Now, Matthew tells about the gathering that comes after this tribulation. And we're almost through here. But um, Matthew 24, 29, 30. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn And they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. This is the rapture, folks, after the tribulation of those days. As a rapture really doesn't take place until pretty much toward the end of that seven-year period. But we want to have our doctrine straight. Um, actually, there's a lot we could elaborate on here, but see, we're just about out of time here. But we want to be like the children of Issachar who know the times and the season, know what Israel ought to do. So there is great revival coming in spite of what you see. And then there's coming a great persecution too. And it's going to kind of coincide together. And I hope that we have made this clear and certainly don't mind people asking questions. And as I said, that's what I like about Bible school setting. You know, people can stop you, kids can stop you and ask us for greater clarification. But I will do that right now just in case anybody wants to ask a question about anything that we have mentioned here. As I said, I was kind of cramming to get down here but uh, any questions on that any I don't have a question but I just have a comment okay Yes, indeed. You know, I've heard ministers say Christ could come tonight or he might not come for another thousand years. That's not true. He can't come tonight unless you die. And a thousand years from now would never fit. There's every, every type points to 7,000 7, years given to man on earth. And, um, you know, that's why You know, we want to understand these things, and especially when revival comes, you have all kinds of people coming who know nothing. We want to know our doctrine. We want to know our theology. Amen? Which one? Uh, 
Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and beginning at 29. After the tribulation of those days. We see a few verses earlier, the tribulation beginning after the abomination. And then it's, you know, there's three and a half years of great tribulation. And at the end of that, uh, after the tribulation of those days, then comes the sign, the coming of the Son of Man, and he gathers his elect. That's the rapture. Okay. I think I think a lot of this revival is going to take place during a time of trouble, just like the early church. I mean, they, you take a look at the beginning chapters of Acts, I mean, they were fighting against a lot of opposition. In fact, they were scattered because of the opposition. But I, I really think that it's going to coincide. Like Isaiah 21, you know, it talks about the morning and the night coming together. And, you know, I believe that for some it's going to be, it's going to be light and for others it's going to be darkness. So I believe it's coming together, both. Any other questions? Yes, Josiah. Um, the dispensation, like, so when Christ left the earth, he kind of said, I'm going to leave my spirit to kind of be your comforter and, and so we've kind of the church age has kind of been I guess like guided by the Holy Spirit in a sense because um, mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit is here with us yes. and so when he comes back is it I guess it, I mean we think of like the, the old covenant and then the new covenant of the, the church age is it are we going to in the millennium is it going to essentially be a different covenant with God's people because it's like a whole new phase of of living. Does the scripture bear that out at all? Or? Will people still speak in tongues in the millennium? Is that what? You're... Well, that's not really the point. But like, obviously, there's like the old covenant, the new covenant, and then you mm-hmm. get into the millennium. Does that enter into a a, a new? I think covenant? it's it's kind of a mix uh, of the two. Together. Yeah, because I mean. I be, right, I mean, Israel has to offer sacrifices during the millennium. And they're doing it because of a judgment. And, you know, even because they rejected their sacrifice, even for the next thousand years, they're going to be offering sacrifices. It's it's a judgment. It's not because they didn't get it, you know. So it's kind of a mix of the two. It's kind of a different age. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think tongues shall cease. I don't think uh, it's, there's going to be the baptism in the Holy Spirit during the millennium like we know it. But people get saved. There's mortals here. They're still preaching the gospel. People still accept or reject. And, um, of course, at the at the end of the millennium is the great white throne, and that's when everybody has to you know, find out, I mean, they're either in the book or they're not, that's all. But there's preaching, there's churches, there'll still be churches throughout the millennium. Um, I've often said, uh, you know, if uh, during the millennium, by God's grace, uh, we can have some very special speakers at our church, like maybe Martin Luther could come, or maybe the Apostle Paul, or, you know. But... So obviously, those that are born in the millennium, do they have? I I don't even know if this is worth asking, but do they have an opportunity to? I mean, obviously, the kind of the first resurrection has already happened. So, is there a, an opportunity for them to enter into the greater things of God? You mean immortality? Maybe. Yeah, yeah they could enter immortality, but uh, I think if you look at the three women um, connected with Abraham. You have Hagar. She's Old Testament. 
Sarah's New Testament. And then who's the third one? Keturah, right, Keturah. And, you know, the thing about Keturah's children, you know, Abraham blessed them and sent them away. They didn't have the promise of Isaac. The greatest promise goes to Isaac, which is the church, because they have to endure a lot more temptation. I mean, during the millennium, the temptations are much less than they are now because there's no devil to contend with. There's no evil spirits to contend with. I mean, there's still sin in the millennium, but it's the old nature, but they don't have to contend with some of the things that we do. So uh, I think Keturah gives us a picture of those born in the millennium. Okay? So, uh, you know, they'll be saved, they'll be blessed, uh, but they don't have quite the place that the church has. The church has the greater part in eternity. Isaac. We're, we're the Isaac of God. Okay?